I realize is, is that death is an individual journey in a way. But I have a hunch that in our individualism right now, perhaps the sign of our time is that we are living as Holy Saturday people. As people in the tomb, people kind of sealed up and alone, people feeling separate and a little depressed. <laughs> so I wanted to share with you my most recent poem that's never been out public before. They're like my children. They're in, I have some of my children in my book, but this one is it's newly in public, and, I, and so I'm a little nervous putting it out there. So please be nice to my kindergartner, OK? Um, <laughs> But it's about the Holy Saturday life, and it goes like this. The world changed in creeping evolution, unseen in slowness, but revolutionized. Neighbors moved, landmarks morphed, tried and true rang false. A slow, so, a slow surrender to letting go of expectations, plots plans. Control dies at the crossroads of hunger and grace. We entombed people grope in the dark doubt of puzzlement, nourished by braille promises, trying new risks into the heart of fidelity, seeming failure, folly, but trusting our plea is heard. In the gap between heartbreak and hope reverberates the cry, come out. I believe the words of this day are come out. Come out and meet the people that Mary spoke so eloquently of at Eucharist. Come out and meet the woman that I met in Chicago on the bus in the fall who had worked for 13 years at a car wash. This undocumented immigrant had worked for 13 years and her employer had told her labor laws did not apply to immigrants. So she worked for tips only for 13 years. Finally, she got connected with this amazing uh, law center in uh, called Arise in Chicago. And she, they were able to get her back pay, but there's a statute of limitations, so they could only get back pay for four years. Come out and meet her and know that there are consequences. Come out and meet Robin, who I got to meet at the White House. Robin was this amazing young woman, probably like 27, 28, who was at the White House, in the White House, could not believe it. She was so excited. I got talking to her because I was sitting next to her, but we were in the second row and the president was going to come and sign an executive order to raise minimum wage for federal contract workers. And Robin was taking a picture with her phone of her chair. And then she asked, would I take a picture of her in the chair? <laughs> and of course, of course I would. And so we got talking, and I complimented her on this sapphire blue dress that she had on. And she said, oh, I got it at my store. I work at a store full time. I make minimum wage, she says. But I got it with my employee discount, and it was on sale. I paid $20.43 for it. Do you like it? It was exquisite. And then we talked further, and she said, you know, by looking at me, you would never know I have to live in a homeless shelter because I can't afford rent in this D.C. area on minimum wage. I got a 10 cent an hour raise, so she made 735 at the time. But I'm here to celebrate my friend because she's going to get a raise because of the president. And I know if she gets a raise, eventually I will. We need to come out and have conversations about what is it in our nation where people can work full time for minimum wage and live in a homeless shelter because they have no choice.
Who are we as a nation where work doesn't pay? Where we have always said work was the way forward. And where my beloved nemesis, Paul Ryan, the congressman from Wisconsin, just keeps saying, well, we need to incentivize work. <laughs> the latest data that came out from Pew a few weeks ago said that 73% of the households receiving safety net programs have at least one adult working full time. 73%. I believe work is highly incentivized already. What about work that pays? Come and meet this CEO that I met. His name's Jason. Jason is this amazing guy in Southern California, one of those 35-year-old geniuses. And he said he didn't do that well in college. He graduated, but he's got a feel for business. And he was about to sell his third business. And, um, but he said he was getting upset because he realized that his tax dollars were going to fund his competitors. I was like, what? Tell me about this. Well, he paid a living wage in Southern California, in San Diego. He paid a living wage to all of his workers so that the lowest wage person made enough to support their family and would not be like Robin. But Jason realized that not all his competitors did that. He had competitors who paid low wages and could therefore bid lower on contracts they were bidding for. And because Jason believed in doing the right thing, he was willing to pay a living wage. But these other folks weren't. They were making their employees to survive use the safety net. And Jason learned that his tax dollars were fun was funding the safety net, which allowed the workers to survive, work for less, and then allow his competitors to bid a lower price. See how that works? So we're doing these business roundtables at Network because I, I always talk about we're for the 100%. We're for all of us together. That's where I think faith and justice come together. It's about all of us working together. But I raised at one of the business roundtables in Denver this question, is it right that an employer should pay a low wage and expect their employees to use the safety net programs that were designed to be for folks who fell on hard times in a moment of crisis? And this entrepreneur said, well, why shouldn't we take an edge if we can get it? Because we're in this together, be all of us. We. We need to come out of the tomb of our isolation, individualism, and my self-centeredness. Come out to know that this is together we need to act. But it's not just the CEOs, it's not just Jason, it's not just the workers. You know what? It's about all of us. It is about the 100%. I, as a Catholic sister, we take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And poverty often gets interpreted in my beloved community as getting the lowest possible price. Now, many of my sisters say that I can squeeze a penny tighter than just about anybody else in the universe. But what I've come to realize is my obsession with the lowest price feeds Jason's competitors or their equivalent. And it becomes a question, what is the most just price? And so in coming out of the tomb of my individualism, I've gotten a little nosy. So that I will ask in a restaurant, do you make more than minimum wage for tip workers, which is currently federally $2.13 an hour, do you get more than tips? 
I'll ask at a grocery store, do you have a union? Do you get better pay? I'll ask at, now Robin educated me that in a clothing store, these are some of the most exploited folks around. And so I'll ask, do you get a just wage? It's those kinds of questions that we're called to when we come out of the tomb of our individualism. Because we are in this together. And then there's Margaret. I have to find her picture. I carry her. I carry a lot of people in my Bible, but Margaret's. On the bus, on the first bus trip, Margaret's sister, Jeannie, brought me her picture. Margaret died at the age of 56 because when she lost her job in the recession, she lost her health care. And when she lost her health care, even though she knew she had a propensity to colon cancer in their family, she couldn't afford screenings. And by the time she finally was taken to the emergency room, she was terminally ill. Jeannie brought me her picture direct from her memorial service. And of course, I cried everything. So I held Jeannie, I held Jeannie's partner, Lynn, and we cried. And, and I've carried Margaret's picture with me in my Bible. Because Margaret fuels my passion for Medicaid expansion, for healthcare expansion. And while we're in Massachusetts, and I've learned not all of you are registered in Massachusetts, the reason why we have the Affordable Care Act is thanks to Massachusetts that we don't have a better law just because you voted for Senator Brown to take Senator Kennedy's place. But that's right, I'm trying not to be bitter. But <laughs> the, the challenge of the Affordable Care Act was never was supposed to be the final bill, but it was the only way forward because you elected Senator Brown which ironically, he had run on never voting for health care reform, even though it didn't affect Massachusetts at all. I just didn't get it. But anyway, that was, those are politics. That's politics. But Margaret fuels my passion for health care reform. But do you know, last fall on the bus, we were in Lexington, Kentucky, getting ready for a rally and uh, for turning out the vote. And this woman comes up. I'm, it was a high-class rally. We even had chairs here. So I was sitting down, and this woman comes up and puts her hand on my shoulder and says, I'm Nancy Whiting. I'm one, one of Margaret Kistler's sisters. And I just want to say thank you. You've helped heal our family. Thank you. And she walked away. It was like, what? You know how when your mind's someplace else, and then something interviewed, it was like, did I hear that right? What? 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 So I ran after her and caught up with her. And it turns out that the Kissler family had been fighting with each other, saying, you should have taken care of her. You should have looked in her. Well, you were closer. Well, you're a nurse. You should have. Blah, blah, blah. You know how families are when they're guilty? <laughs> and what happened was my speaking of Margaret and carrying Margaret's picture had begun to make sense for them of an otherwise senseless death. And they could forgive each other because something good was coming out of this painful truth. But then what I realized was, Margaret has fueled my energy, my passion. But my passion then heals them. And it is true, we are in this together. We are not isolates. We are not individuals. We need to come out of that the tomb of individualism. Come out. Come out because we need to work for each other. All the choices we make have ripple effects. So the question becomes, do we act? Do we have a sense of urgency? Have our hearts been broken open? Because what I've realized is the stone that, he, that keeps us in is a heart of stone. And to change or have that stone rolled away is to have our hearts broken open. Because when my heart is broken open, I have room for everyone. There's room in my heart. No one can be left out of my care. It is about the 100%. That 
living together becomes the key for action. Because if I see this woman in Chicago, or I see Jason struggling with his business and his employees, or I see Margaret and her sisters Nancy and Jeannie and the ones I haven't met, how can I stay silent? How can I stop? I can't. Because we are in this together. And so I have come to learn that the challenge that we face that Mary spoke of in the liturgy is what I call radical acceptance. Radical acceptance of the entrepreneur who'll say, why shouldn't business take an edge? As well as Jason who says, I'm trying hard to do the right thing. Or of the, of the car wash owner who had this woman work for tips for 13 years. It's just wrong. But radical acceptance means everyone has a claim on my heart. Now, I often think we should have picked somebody else to follow. Jesus' message of loving everybody. Now, that's a nice theory, but... <laughs> and on retreat a few years ago, I got pushed to recognize the fact that I had a list that I referred to in my head mentally that I hadn't really realized. I had my mistake of God list. <laughs> you know, God on an off day. A model not to be repeated. <laughs> but what we're called to is to radical acceptance, even of those folks. Now, my, my, radic my uh, list of mistakes of God have a lot of politicians on them. And, I mean, have you ever noticed Mitch McConnell doesn't have lips? I mean, that's just wrong. <laughs> But the fact is, he too is loved by God. Then I came to this holy place of realizing that I'm probably on some people's mistake of God list. <laughs> That's sobering. It's me? <laughs> I could name a few cardinals that it's true for, but... But on this retreat, I then got pushed to, after getting to the holy place of radically accepting, then our retreat director says, all right, now add in fighting. Fighting? I just got to this point of radically accepting. What do you mean fighting? It's dualistic, it separates, it destroys, blah, blah, blah. And Pat Hawk, the, the redemptorist priest, was our retreat director. He, he find me, found me mildly amusing. He says, oh, go meditate on it. So what I came to discover is that what we are called to is too often we think of fighting as fighting against. That we, we use those, that language. We're going to push back against. I love it. You know, a good fight. I'm a lawyer. I like winning. So pushing back. But well, what I've come to realize is what the gospel calls us to is not fighting against, but it's rather standing side by side and fighting for a vision that is something that we share. Fighting for a vision where all benefit, where we can stand together and articulate together that place where justice reigns, that's just ahead of us that we can envision but not yet reach. It's fighting for a vision that embraces all. And my discovery is that when you put radical acceptance together with fighting for a vision, that's fire. That is the fire of God flaming up in our time. It is the fire of God like the burning bush where God flamed up and said to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying for help on account of their taskmasters. Yes, I am well aware of their sufferings. 
and I have come. My view is that we are called to that moment to come out of our entombment of individualism, come out of our lethargy, come out and let God flame up in our lives. Because if we look around at Robin and Jason and Margaret and Nancy, we will weep. But weeping sets the fire free. And rather than dousing the fire, it impels and fuels the fire to that Pentecost reality where that flame is no longer found in the desert, but is found in each one of our lives, where we are called to be the body of God. We are called to be the place where God flames up, and as long as we are faithful, we will not be destroyed. Come out of your individualism, your complacency, your, your fear, the temptation to hunker down and hide. Come out. Because the truth of this is, is that we are in this together. And sometimes being in it together can be comforting. It can also be challenging because it's not just about my view. It's about all of us together finding the way forward for this vision. And so to kind of conclude this part and then open it up for conversation, I want to conclude by sharing a poem that I wrote when we were in Iraq in 2002. And the, um, oh, our last night in Baghdad, <laughs> we went to an Italian restaurant. That was. Odd. But it was in the embassy area. And when we came back from the restaurant, we stood outside. Um, there was a wedding party out on the sidewalk in the light from the plate glass window. And that, um, they, they had this old violin and an accordion, and they were dancing. This wedding party was dancing. And so there were 11 of us, and we kind of stood on the side and watched. And then we got drawn in to dance at this wedding party. And this guy, who stood about this tall, was next to me, and he was trying to show me this sort of a folk dance horror type thing. And I'm a poet, not a dancer, but I tried. And he leans over and he says to me, how long do my niece and her husband have to live in peace? How long until you start bombing us? This is the poem that was given that night, and it's called Incarnation. This is what we're called to. Let gratitude be the beat of our heart, pounding Baghdad rhythms, circulating memories, meaning of the journey. Let resolve flow in our veins, fueled by Basra's destitution, risking reflective action in a 15-second world. Let compassion be our hands, reaching to be with each other, all others, to touch, hold, heal this fractured world. Let wisdom be our feet, bringing us to the crying need, to friends or foe, to share this body's blood. Let love be our eyes, that we might see the beauty, see the dream, lurking in the shadows of despair and dread. Let community be our body warmth, radiating Arab energy to welcome in the foreign stranger, even the ones who wage this war. And let us remember on drear distant days, we are a promised Christmas joy. We live as one this fragile, gifted life, for we are the body of God. Thank you very much. Now, this is my favorite part. 
Um, I've heard me talk before, so. Um, but what I always love is the exchange and the reflections, comments, uh, questions, engagement. We've got a really nice crowd here, and we have oh, nice time to do it. Um, so we have microphones that can win their way around. Now. I know sometimes I'm in a group of introverts and I need to give you a little time to think. Uh, one time I did this in a contemplative community down in South Carolina. <laughs> it was a very long time to think. And I'm an extrovert, so it made me nervous. They were fine, but... You know. Oh, I would you. like to ask a question. Uh, I think that many of us may want to know uh, insight from you. Several leading candidates from the Republican Party are Catholics. Oh, and uh, because uh, Pope uh, Francis had wonderful sayings about economics and uh, released something on climate change. I was wondering whether uh, the change of the leadership at Vatican will make some difference in uh, our com uh, upcoming election. Thank you. Let us pray to the Lord. <laughs> um, Pope Francis is fabulous, and he's coming September 24th to talk to Congress, and I think, did John Boehner read anything that the Pope's written? <laughs> Maybe not. The Holy Spirit is alive and well. Um, uh, what I just went to get is Pope Francis's Joy of the Gospel. Uh, some of you have read Joy of the Gospel? Have you read? If you haven't, I encourage you to do it. Uh, the nourishment of this document, you know, usually my people are noted for boring, but this is like alive and spoken from the heart of Pope Francis. It is fantastic. But his whole section on economic analysis he, he, in paragraph 202 is, the need to resolve the structural causes of poverty cannot be delayed, not only for the pragmatic reason of its urgency for the good order of society, but because society needs to be cured of a sickness which is weakening and frustrating it, and which can only lead to new crises. And the challenge he lays down for the more progressive folks is, Welfare projects which meet certain urgent needs should be considered merely temporary responses. As long as the problems of the poor are not radically resolved by rejecting the absolute autonomy of markets and financial speculation and by attacking the structural causes of inequality, no solution will be found for the world's problems, or for that matter, to any problems. Inequality is the root of social ill. But then get this, he goes on in the same vein and goes on and goes on and goes on. Then paragraph 208, if anyone feels offended by my words, I would respond that I speak them with affection and with the best of intentions. Quite apart from any personal interest or political ideology, my words are not those of a foe or an opponent. I'm interested only in helping those who are in thrall to an individualistic, indifferent, and self-centered mentality to be free of those unworthy chains and to attain a way of living and thinking which is more humane, noble, and fruitful, and which will bring dignity to their presence on this earth. Isn't that fantastic? I'm only thinking of you. But here's the challenge, that within my beloved tradition, those are words that, haven't, that have been written but not spoken. We have such a deep, long history of Catholic social teaching, which really is a foundation principle for all that Pope Francis is doing. But Pope Francis has embodied this in love. And his challenge to all of us is that we walk towards justice with love. Now many in the Republican Party thought they had a lock on the leadership of my beloved tradition. Well, they don't anymore, thank heavens. But the challenge is, is that conversion is always resisted. And wherever there is resistance for any of us is the edge of spiritual growth. And so the challenge will be is to nourish 
these folks enough that they can open up to that risk of conversion because it does require them to then come out. I don't know if they can make it. I don't know if they can do it, but we'll see. That's why we at Network, which you should all join us, but uh, our organization works at that intersection of faith and politics and trying to nourish them enough and so like with Paul Ryan, I've lobbied him a number of times, and so my, my statement to Paul Ryan always is, come meet my people. I'd like you to meet my people. Because I think once you meet the people, once they've touched your heart, then we can't stay walled up in our certitude. It's too risky though for him so far. But I keep trying. So I don't know what's going to happen. It is a mystery. The irony, ironies of ironies, is that we've got a lot of uh, Republican leaders that are Roman Catholic. We've got a lot of Democratic leaders that are Roman Catholic. And though allegedly, I don't understand how one faith can lead us in such different directions. But it has. So we'll see. Yes, up here in the front. The microphone is coming. You speaking, I think of the, I see the prophet Amos up there. Oh, thank you. But you, you remind me of a very rich man during the depth of the Depression that would not give a cent to help the poor. And he came to see my father and he said, I am a self-made man. And my father's answer was, I'm so glad you admit it. You, admit, you, admit, you relieve God for an awful responsibility. <gasps> oh, you relieve God of an awful responsibility. Oh. I'm going to hold on to that line. I, I sort of feel like Johnny Appleseed, where, where I go around the country planting these little seeds, but the other thing that I do is I pick up little seeds elsewhere. So thank you. That, that's, that's a wonderful one. So my question is a little bit personal because I've been involved with community organizing, but I also work full time and my workloads increase and I'm starting to experience burnout and, and some members of my organization also experience burnout from time to time. So my question is, how do you nurture yourself so that you don't experience burnout or activist fatigue or compassion fatigue? Good question. Here's the deal. As long as, a couple of things. Prayer is essential. Staying grounded in a practice of prayer, which is more about listening than telling God how God ought to run the world. Uh, I, I mean, I'm forever volunteering to be God for a day. Just uh, relax, take over. I've got it, I've got it. Um, the, but to listen deeply to the spirit. And when my heart is broken open by Margaret and everybody else, then I have what I call a, a spirituality of walking willing, of responding, of just doing my part. Now, I think burnout happens when I develop or I get sucked into that mistaken idea I'm in charge, I'm in control, I'm the measure of what should be happening. And I, um, I feel that weight. But what I've come to realize is Paul's right. We are one body. We're one body and that we each have a part to play. And we have to rejoice in our part. So I spent some time in prayer trying to figure out what my part was because it's not the whole thing. I'm not the entire body. It's just this one little part. So I had this insight one day, that a little while ago, that I think I'm stomach acid in the body of Christ. <laughs> because my job is, I can't do what Mary's doing. I can't, I, that's not where I'm called, but they break my, those folks break my heart. I, I'm not called to the soup kitchen. I'm not called to do the legal work for the woman in Chicago, though my heart responded in that way. I'm called to carry those stories. And that's my part. And so stomach acid is essential for metabolizing food. 
it is really important, but in large quantities it can be toxic. <laughs> and, and it needs to be contained, and it relies on a whole bunch of different other organs to make it all work. So knowing my part eases my sense of responsibility for the whole. And trust, I trust that if I do my part, you'll do yours. And then the whole gets met. Coming out of the two means letting myself out of my own sense of obligation and control. You notice, I don't know if you notice in my little poem. Where did my poem go? Oh, here it is. Th this part about groping in the dark, uh, uh, control, where is it? Oh. A slow surrender to letting go expectations, plots, and plans. We do the best we can. We listen deeply. But you'll notice that your theme, walk towards justice, doesn't necessarily come with a GPS <laughs> or all the stops along the way. But the idea is that we continue this movement. It's like the Exodus. We wandered around in the desert for 40 years, and you would think that was not a good plan. <laughs> but what it was was it was a chance to build community. And so for me, there are days when, uh, recently, recently, um, I, I've felt some burden of expectation, and, and my mantra was, or not the expectation, just that I've been coasting for a while. And so my mantra had recently, my prayer has been, please wake me up, please wake me up. Because my favorite part is new insights. <laughs> That's what keeps me going, but um, I think it's about letting go of control and just knowing we're doing the best we can. And that's enough. That's enough. So my stomach acid, well, mm, it relies on everybody else. It's freeing. It's freeing to get there. But it's also hard to let go because I also have some I mean, in like legislation, I, we lobby. I, I've got a whole bunch of ideas on that, but we just keep going. We just keep going. Good question. Thank you. We're back here. I was, I was very moved by your uh, trip to Iraq and your witness there in 2002. And it reminded me of the fact that um, the war has continued for, it only started in March of 2003, but it's continued and continued. And I wonder how you think and how you relate and what counsel you would give us in our own meditation and relationship to the Christians who are in the Middle East, but especially in Iraq and Syria. Amen. Amen. Well, right now, um, I mean, the way network does policy is if we're in relationship with folks. And so we're in relationship with the Iraqi Dominican sisters who had to flee ISIS. Uh, they were based in Mosul. They went first to Karakosh and then had to flee from Karakosh to Erbil and are now... Um, in the Kurdish region trying to minister to their people. Um, but it's not just uh, the Christians. The Christians have a huge problem, but it's also the Yazidis or the Shia or some Sunni um, and are being persecuted. And so it is, for the Iraqi Dominican sisters, what they see is the anguish of their people suffering, and they've always been about serving everyone in, uh, and uh, they run a maternity hospital that we went to in Baghdad when we were there in O2, and they still do to this day, and it's like one of the best maternity hospitals in Baghdad. They serve everybody. But the, the challenge for them now in Kurdistan is that the, they, in the Kurdistan, the education is in Kurdish, not in Arabic, and none of the kids speak Kurdish, and so they all speak Arabic, and so there's no schooling available to these kids. And all these professionals have fled, and now it's been nine months, and there's no hope, there's no end in sight. And so I've been trying to work with the State Department to 
Their idea is maybe if they could get a, a protected zone in the Nineveh, Nineveh Plains, which is where most of them come from, that area, that if they could get a protected zone, that they, they might be able to get some uh, stability. Um, they don't, the majority don't want to leave. But do you know last year we only allowed in 90 refugees from uh, Syria or uh, Iraq? And in many ways, they don't want to leave their homeland, but they're also getting really depressed that they don't know that this will ever change. And it seems to me that we have a really huge responsibility for the mess that's there now, but it is totally beyond our control to fix. And I think that anguish will haunt us, should haunt us, and that um, as a source of prayer, um, that's certainly something beyond our control, is help, help, and then be open to what you hear. Uh, we're trying to get Sister Diana, one of the Iraqi Dominicans, to D.C. to testify about the situation, especially for women and children, and what's going on there. Um, That's awful. Syria is awful too. I mean, the Assad regime is not, it's like the Hussein, uh, Saddam Hussein's regime is that it was good for the people who weren't political. It was bad for political uh, competitors. Because when we were in Syria in 08, um, the Good Shepherd Sisters had started the first um, battered women's shelter in all of the Middle East with Assad's support, that he had also supported their uh, hotline for abused women, uh, which is like, I mean, it's historic in the Arab countries. So that he was very supportive of women's leadership, which is one of the things that makes the very conservative Muslims upset. And so the sisters are having a very difficult time Try, uh, they've had to close down the uh, hotline because it was so identified with Assad that it could be subject to attack. And, but they still have the women's shelter, but now it's more of a refugee shelter. Um, we have no idea. And we're so arrogant. We, the United States, is so arrogant in our analysis, and we have no idea of the complexity on the ground. And that Renner, uh, who was the first uh, guy in charge of Iraq after the invasion, was the most arrogant, certain um, ignoramus, in my humble opinion. I know, radical acceptance, but man. Um, he had no clue what he was dealing with. So he created chaos. We created chaos. Thank you for asking that question. It's really important. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sister, for your witness and for your words today. Um, my question goes back to your uh, clarity about your role in the body of Christ being <laughs> the stomach acid. So I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about the particular role of seminaries mm. in breaking open hearts and sending forth leaders who are uh, full of compassion and able to engage courageously in the work that you're calling us to. What an interesting question. <laughs> I wonder, I, I mean, I've had a little conversation with a few of you, and I've heard how EDS is different. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I have a couple of good friends that are in the Episcopal tradition, and um, CDSP out at out in California gave me a honorary doctorate a couple years ago, and so I, I know a little bit of the politics. I wonder if each of your schools is a different part, and I wonder if maybe praying together about how do you make how do you help create ministers for the whole body might be an interesting uh, project. Um, as you each have a different role or a different perspective. 
But as I'm saying this, the thing that pops in my head is maybe your bone marrow. Now, as I understand bone marrow is that it generates blood cells to run around the body and carry all of the nutrients and nourish all the different parts. And maybe the bone marrow is um, that place where it's a little shielded inside the bone, but also is essential for health of the rest of the body. I don't know, it's just a thought that occurred to me. Could be an interesting image to think about. And Lord knows you've got enough medical facilities here in Boston, you could explore it some more. Look what happens to bone marrow when it runs amok. Hmm, pretty bad. Interesting. Ooh, what a great image. Then I had this question the other day. I, I'm part of this Auburn Media Fellows. Um, There's a problem when I get talking like this. Is you just hear all my half-thought thoughts. But um, I begin, since I'm at EDS and you've all told me you're, you're great, um, I, uh, I wondered the other day, do conservatives have poetry? Because that's a very poetic question to catch that. I don't know, I can't figure this out. But isn't that an interesting wondering? Hmm. Or is that our job? I don't know. Thank you. I'd be interested if you do more thinking about it. I'd be, I'd be curious. And again, thank you. It's nice to hear the phrase signs of the times. Again, it's been a, too long. I get really discouraged when I look at the effect that money has on politics and that capitalism has in grinding down. Uh, many of us, even those of us who are well educated, what gives you hope in the face of, in the face of that kind of opposing power? Good question. Um, the Holy Spirit. Good, because look at this. Money is a serious problem. And, and for that reason, our organization uh, has just claimed a 2020 vision, like perfect vision. 20, our 2020 vision is to mend the gap and to deal with income and wealth gap, but also things like health disparities, housing, um, and we've got a couple of others, and, and we don't have it fully fleshed out, but we're in the process of putting it together. So September, when Pope Francis comes, then as he talks about this stuff, we're going to say, ta-da! So that's the idea. But what I do know is that the bus is a really low-budget operation, though it feels like a lot of money to us, but it's a low-budget operation and it galvanizes people. That in the end, dollars don't vote, people do. And what is needed is community. And community cannot be created by money. Community is really in so many ways divided by money. And that the challenge then becomes that convening quality of bringing people in, where we need everyone. Now last year, last fall, we did door knocking and uh, we were out on the road for five weeks. It was entirely too long uh, for a wide variety of reasons. We were only going to be gone three and a half and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, you don't need all that. But what happened was we were, I'm haunted by some of the people I met when we were door knocking in places. We were in Colorado Springs. I go I'm knocking on doors, encouraging people to vote. And this tall, good looking African American young man comes to the door, Colorado Springs. Do you know anything about the politics of Colorado Springs? And this, they're conservative, if you don't know. And um, I find out this young man is a vet, disabled vet, told me he was getting good service. For, I don't know if it was from veterans or from active military. And he, uh, then I asked him, are you going to vote? You know, nope, not going to vote. You put your life on the line for our nation, but you're not going to vote? People around here don't want my opinion. They don't want me involved. 
And you think what we celebrate here, Jonathan's giving his life in that cause to be able to vote. But then all of the other ways that we push people out. And so that the other aspect of justice and another aspect of justice becomes how do we invite inclusion? And we don't need money to do that. We need relationships. And so then we become missionaries of inclusion. And so I said to him, I really wanted his voice and vote, but I was going to leave town that afternoon. So it was easy for me to say. But I wanted him to know he mattered to me. But I'm haunted by it. People are pushed out by all this negative ads. And the only antidote we have is each other. But let me tell you about the Holy Spirit, though, because the, uh, my community is dedicated to the Holy Spirit, so um, I'm partial. Uh, but the, the, the thing that often gets lost is that um, the bus got created because the Vatican named our little organization Network in the censure of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious as being a bad influence on Catholic sisters because we, uh, we had radical, promoted radical feminist themes incompatible with the gospel. And uh, I loved it, it was great. But, the, um, but yeah, right. But the thing you have to know is that the censure came four days after our 40th anniversary party in DC where the big question at Network's 40th anniversary party was, how do we let our name out there? How do we let people know? <laughs> Four days later, the Vatican answered our prayer. <laughs> so we say, do we send them a thank you note? <laughs> but, but the key is, the key is, which really goes to our walking towards justice. Remember this thing about, that I was saying about fighting against? The temptation to have engaged that, the Vatican in that would have been fighting against. And my prayer was, how do we use this moment for mission? How do we move, use this moment to, lift, to do the thing we'd been doing was fighting the Paul Ryan budget? And so I invited, what came to me in my prayer was that story of uh, the Samaritan women at the well. Remember that? Jesus is in Samaria, not in Israel. A man's not supposed to talk to a woman. A Jew's not supposed to talk to a Samaritan. And what does Jesus do? Ask her for help. And so where that, my prayer took me was to ask our secular colleagues in D.C. for help. Because all the Catholics, they were, oh, they were just impossible. They were so mad and upset and depressed. So, um, and then some Catholics said, well, could we come? And I said, yeah, but if you don't talk. And because uh, I just didn't want, I, I wanted to see how do we use this moment for mission. And at the end of an hour and a half meeting, we were going on the road. We were pushing back against the Ryan budget. We were lifting up the works of Catholic sisters. And we were going in a wrapped bus. I had no idea what a wrapped bus was. I was so afraid it had something to do with rap music. But it turned out, it turned out it was W-R-A-P. You know, it's that beautiful design on the bus. And uh, so I was so relieved when I found that out. And, um, but it really is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in my view, that used that moment for something bigger than us. When I wrote the healthcare letter in 2010, it was really like a, I can say these things here, I love it, a nunc dimittis moment. Now you can dismiss your servant, O Lord, in peace. Because it was like I had done something that made a difference for others. And then, to have this opportunity with the bus, it's beyond, beyond description. I, I mean, that, that line of incarn the poem Incarnation is, let gratitude be the beat of our heart. How can we not be grateful? But as long as we stay focused on mission and engaged with each other, then we can be the antidote to money. Because the, the thing that money fuels is fear. And we're the natural antidote. Yeah. This is fun. Oh, oh this is our last one because, sorry, sorry. Ooh. So I have a two-pronged question. The first is um, you started out your uh, offering to us today by saying that you were... Uh, inspired by Jonathan Daniels and how he, uh, for you, was a person who helped you see the intersection between faith and justice 
and helped you enter the convent. So, if you were a young adult today, who would inspire you? And the second question is, because you um, have told us how important it is to nurture relationships, how would, you, would you, how would you give us any advice to nurture relationships for young adults who are looking to do the same, to nurture their relationship and community in the body of Christ between faith and justice? Good question. Um, people tell me that I inspire them. That, that what we've done on the bus is inspiring. But you know, really, the folks that in, inspire me are the Robins and the Margarets and the entrepreneurs, the Jasons, the, you know, these folks doing amazing things, holding their values. And my hunch is um, just the way I had no idea that my holding up Margaret was healing for her family. I think we don't have a clue about the consequence. How you all are nourishment for the for young people. Now, the other thing I know about young people, because we're blessed with a bunch of great ones at Network, is that they nourish me, and that they're highly engaged. Um, Walter Brueggemann is one of my favorite authors, and in his second edition of Prophetic Imagination, he says there's five characteristics of a community that nurtures a prophetic imagination. And invite me back sometime, and I can do all five. But the fourth one is, the, um, and, and the other thing is I have to say is, I have no idea if he would agree with what I say about these five characteristics, but I think they're fabulous. But the fourth one is, is effective discourse across generations and cultures. And what we're blessed with at Network are young folks that come. We get a, a slew of them every year. We've got some middle folks and a couple of old folks like me. And the, the joy of having young folks is the enthusiasm, the willingness, the opportunity to risk. Helps some of us old fuddy-duddies. Well, I remember we tried that back in 1974. <laughs> And it just didn't work then. It won't work now. You know, I mean, really. So, but they've also, another thing, another joy of young people is they got me into Twitter. I used to call them twits. They were just twits. And now, and now I'm this avid Twitter follower. That's where all my competitive nature goes. Um, but I think, I think young people are doing quite well. And that's a question to ask them who inspires them. And let, let you, if you are inspired by them, tell them, because they don't see it. They don't see it. And so I, I think we have to do that with each other. Then you had your second part. I got distracted by your first part. Uh, how do you nurture your young adults? Oh, how do you nurture? Oh, tell them you love them. That's easy. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah. And join you. We need you. See, I think too often we look, we in... Uh, we Catholic sisters can look to organize like we don't need help. But we need everybody. Grocery store missionary work is required by everybody. That's talking in line at the grocery store to somebody in front of you, behind you, about something that matters, not just the Red Sox. Or that Brady maybe didn't have the fully inflated ball. I mean, please, talk about something that matters. All right, we're going to end with a poem because I have to do this. Because along those lines, all the things that we've talked about walking towards justice can feel like it's too much. And after the first bus trip, I just felt totally overwhelmed. And this is the poem that comes from it. But the only thing that you need to know is that at the end of Matthew's gospel, remember the story of loaves and fish. This is the story of loaves and fish. At the, in Matthew 14, at the end of that account, it says, in a very annoying way, 5,000 men were fed to say nothing of the women and children. <laughs> well, that annoyed me. So, as you can tell, I pray about things that annoy me, and I wondered, why was that? Well, I had this insight. They only counted the ones who thought it was a miracle. The women knew they'd brought snacks from home. <laughs> 
And so the guys, as usual, they pull out all this food. They go, oh, food, what a miracle. <laughs> all right. In that context, here is a closing poem, Loaves and Fish. I always joked that the miracle of loaves and fish was sharing. The women always knew this. But in this moment of need and notoriety, I ache, tremble, almost weep at folks so hungry, malnourished, faced with spiritual famine of epic proportions. My heart aches with their need. Apostle-like, I whine. What are we among so many? The consistent 2,000-year-old ever-new response is this. Blessed and broken, you are enough. I savor the blessed, cower at the broken, and pray to be enough. Thank you very much.